On October 29, 1989, more than 1,000 people gathered in Boston for a major national conference sponsored by the Boston Chapter of CAMERA, the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America. It was a conference that focused on and documented the need to consistently and aggressively challenge the tone, accuracy, and fairness of the media's coverage of Middle East issues, coverage which plays a vital role in America's perceptions of and policies towards Israel and her neighbors. The media wants every important institution in this country to be scrutinized, except the media. This is not consistent. This is not consistent with freedom of speech, and this conference marks the end of those days. Many Americans who are fair can sense some unsettling instinct that a lot of news is just not being delivered in the news they get. And to see a, a meeting like as is taking place today, where, where wire service accounts, which are generally fairly objective, are contrasted with the Globe's select uh, picking and pasting of the wire service and, and distortions is is even for me very startling. I hadn't realized just what, what a power some of these papers have. And when I look at this presentation and these choices and this selection, and when I see that it is in fact fueled by this self-righteous moral indignation, which one encounters a lot on various issues in this country, I have to ask myself, am I crazy or are they? Why do they see it this way? Well, I've always been skeptical of the reporting of the news. I was most impressed today by the documentation of the bias in the news, and it's offered me tremendous, uh, a tremendous opportunity to inform my students. If anti-Semitism is a light sleeper, then PBS has just placed 40,000 alarm clocks in American schoolrooms. It's good in the sense that uh, people are presenting the truth. It's fortunate, though, that we have to have a conference like this in 1989. It's uh, very frightening. Former Ambassador and Assistant Secretary of State Alan Keyes set the tone for much of the conference when he defined the revisionist approach that governs the bulk of today's reporting on the Middle East. When you talked about the problems of the Middle East up until I think the last several years in America in the general context, the issue of the Middle East was understood fairly clearly to be an issue of peace and war, an issue of international security, an issue for, for diplomats an issue that was susceptible to trying to understand the background and the history and the motivations of the different parties, trying to parse out what was, what was right and just and unjust, what demands and expectations were legitimate, how they could be met and adjusted so that eventually one would be able to achieve a solution. But they don't talk about peace anymore. A different paradigm has been substituted. Call it what you will. It's a human rights paradigm, the paradigm of Palestinian self-government and self-determination. And the Intifada has successfully managed to substitute in the discussion and consciousness of the world that paradigm for the paradigm of peace and security. We can see in almost every circumstance that once the paradigm shifts, once the emotions have been inflamed, once the victims have been identified, and that sense of violation has been established, there is very little patience for details, for background, for truth. There is just a demand that something be done and that it be done now so we will not be complicit, so that our hands will not be imbrued in the blood and the rights of the innocent. Peace can no longer be discussed with any patience for the background and the history. There are no Arab soldiers. There are no Israeli youth. During the first 22 months of the Intifada, the Boston Globe carried nearly 1,500 articles on the Middle East, more coverage, in fact, than that given to any other regional conflict or all of U.S.-Soviet relations. Boston Camera Executive Director Andrea Levin analyzed the Globe's coverage. The Boston Globe is New England's largest and most powerful paper, reaching millions of readers. It prides itself on being a paper of national importance and stature, and indeed its influence cannot be underestimated. Its constituency encompasses a wide range of people, including opinion makers in academia and politics, and an activist-oriented readership. Unfortunately, it is our view that those who have depended on the globe for full and accurate Middle East coverage 
are among the misinformed and misled. In making such a charge, we are not simply reacting to the printing of unflattering negative accounts of Israel, even frequent ones. We are rather asserting that a pattern of bias exists, one that we can document. And so I begin with a stunning editorial published on February 18, 1988, 70 days into the uprising. Israel's shameful symbols is the voice of the globe commenting on the rioting. Here's what it says. The uprising of Palestinians in the occupied territories replayed around the world as a televised spectacle often seems a morality play told in political symbols. It is an image that calls up collective memories from the history of the Jewish people. The czarist pogroms, the centuries of homelessness and persecution, the mass grave at Babi Yar, the piled bodies found at Nazi death camps in 1945. The event that triggered this linkage of Israelis to Nazis was the so-called burying alive of four Palestinians by Israeli soldiers using a backhoe. While the actions of those soldiers are without question reprehensible, were appropriately denounced by the army and public punished, it must be noted that the victims all walked away from the incident. None needed hospitalization. Such mundane facts, details of fact, however, were irrelevant to the Globe columnist who decided that symbolically this incident was really the same as the systematic slaughter and attempted annihilation of an entire people. 35,000 dead at Babi Yar was as one with the backhoe episode. Consider the episode of Elias Frege, the moderate Arab mayor of Bethlehem, who last December called for a one-year truce in the uprising, just weeks after Yasser Arafat's supposed renunciation of terrorism. Within 24 hours after the peace proposal, Arafat broadcast an assassination threat against the mayor on Monte Carlo radio. He threatened to pump 10 bullets into anyone who tried to quell the violence. Mr. Frege went into hiding. The Arafat threat was a major story, calling into question the PLO leader's commitment to peace. All over the country, newspapers like the Washington Post shown here covered the assassination threat in prominent stories, editorials, and op-ed pieces. This is the one and only article the Globe devoted to the Arafat story. It is one sentence. It appeared on page 45. The previous March, Al Fatah had planted a car bomb outside the hotel of Secretary of State George Shultz in an attempt to assassinate him. The PLO openly claimed responsibility for the attempt. The Globe carried the story, but notice the tentative and oblique headline car bomb believed to target Schultz and the absence of a name of the bomber. Why wouldn't the paper have banner headlined it, Arafat's PLO in assassination attempt against Schultz? The Globe headline shields the PLO and distorts the truth. Needless to say, no Globe editorial ensued. The New York Times headlined a story of the stabbing death of an Israeli this way, Arab girl kills yeshiva student. The Globe ran this title, Slaying may harm Arab ties in Israel. Notice again the obscuring of the killer's identity, indeed the inversion of victim and perpetrator, so that it is the Arab who is somehow suffering as a consequence of the Israeli death. Newspapers all over the world carried prominent stories about the destruction by fire of Israeli forests and protected wildlife. The New York Times front page blazes ravage Israel's forests, Arabs blamed. The Philadelphia Inquirer, Israelis lose cherished trees and fire of Palestinian unrest. The Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, the Atlanta Constitution, the Star Tribune, the Denver Post, and others ran the story prominently. The Globe, on the other hand, waited three weeks and then ran this story on June 24, 1988. Protesters set brush fires in Israel. Protesters. Notice the shielding, the euphemism employed for arsonist. There were, at this point, 40,000 acres destroyed. The Globe considered that the work of protesters. When asked why the Globe hadn't deemed this a newsworthy event, as other papers had, Victor Lewis, a Globe editor, replied, we didn't have proof. We also find outright falsification of fact and history. And as this article, 
life on an island of coexistence illustrates the misrepresentations conform to the globe's particular angle on the Middle East. In this case, the Tunisian island of Jerba is described as an idyllic haven for Jews. The reporter states, quote, the Muslim majority coexists uneventfully, for the most part, with the Jewish community. Uneventfully, if one overlooks the, the October 1985 massacre of Jewish worshippers outside the main synagogue, uneventfully, if one omits mention of the anti-Jewish disturbances throughout Tunisia that resulted in injuries, commercial damage, and American State Department protests, uneventfully, if one overlooks the proliferation of anti-Semitic books and articles in the Tunisian press, I simply cannot bear to watch, which appeared on November 13, 1988, illustrates several other very disturbing practices of the globe. The first is the habit of using Jewish or Israeli critics of Israel, invariably individuals from the extreme left, to voice harsh, often vicious attacks against the state. The article also reveals a manipulation of the text that can only be seen as a calculated effort to malign on the part of the editor in charge. The article, presented in the form of a letter, is supposedly written by an American immigrant to Israel, deeply disenchanted by the Jewish state, and her brother, Alfie Kahn, who is described in the tagline as a Cambridge author. One of the most striking passages reads this way, quote, there are some Jews who come across a newspaper headline, like the one this last Wednesday, that says, Israeli troops kill three-year-old child, and what they see is Israel protects itself from terrorism, or else their first reaction is not shock and horror, but concern about Israel's public image and how non-Jews will view this. I know this reaction because it used to be mine. Today I think about the three-year-old and his parents, about the moral implications of excusing the soldier who pulled the trigger." End quote. Inquiry revealed that indeed the passage I just read was inserted by the Focus editor Nick King sitting in his Boston office on Morrissey Boulevard. He'd imagined himself into the young woman's mind added a few details, some inflammatory comment on the way Jews view themselves and the rest of the world, and never bothered to take credit for his creative addition. The Globe and its editors blandly admitted to this falsification and apparently considered it a perfectly acceptable procedure. Distortion through both the manipulation of emphasis within an article and the suppression of crucial information has been a constant factor in Globe coverage. This article, from February 13, 1988, was the subject of one of our ads, Publicizing Globe Distortions. The Globe picked up a story from the LA Times Washington Post wire service. In its original, the LA Times, in the LA Times, the story told in detail of a mob attack on soldiers in Nablus who had been trying in the days preceding to reduce the level of violent confrontations, had allowed a degree of rock throwing to transpire without responding. As a result of the restraint, violence had declined to the displeasure of the leaders of the uprising who were eager to reignite it. The subtitle fitting, fittingly read, Patrol is attacked after Muslim service, death toll reaches 54. The accompanying photograph showed two masked rioters hurling rocks. The Globe version looks like this. The photograph obviously conveys nothing about provocation. The subtitle states that it was the Israelis who, quote, shattered two days of calm, precisely the opposite of the original. The substance, too, of the article is changed. Gone is the explicit mention of incitement during religious services, as was all of the background concerning efforts to minimize violence. The text has been altered to a narrower view, preventing the reader from seeing the critical full context. What the Globe printed was a half-truth. Finally, I want to show you a comparison which seems to us emblematic of the bias at the Globe. In October 1986, before the uprising, the New York Times reported the sentencing of a Palestinian terrorist leader who had murdered a British tourist and an Israeli woman this way, quote, Israeli court jails Palestinian for life in killing of tourist. The article notes that the Palestinian had earlier blinded himself when a bomb he was building blew up in his face. The Globe headlined it this way, Israelis convict blind Palestinian. <laughs> the distortions propagated by the Globe 
are dangerously misleading to its readers. It is our hope that today's forum and future efforts to heighten public awareness of this problem will sensitize the paper to the need for renewed and serious reflection about their obligations to the public. Thank you. In the three months following the Christian Lebanese massacre of Palestinians at Sabra and Shatila, the New York Times carried more than 190 stories on the massacre, 48 on page one. The paper also carried five editorials, six op-eds, and 15 additional columns on the same subject. Yet three years later, when Shiite militia massacred an equal number of people in the same camps, the New York Times devoted one-eighth as many stories to the massacre, only one editorial, two additional op-ed pieces, and no other columns. Wellesley College historian and professor Gerald Auerbach presented this analysis of all the news that's fit to print. Thomas Friedman's book, From Beirut to Jerusalem, may become a classic case study of American journalism. Not, however, because the author adds significantly to our understanding of Israel. Rather, because Friedman discloses the subjective bias that now masquerades as journalistic objectivity, even in the most rarefied precincts of newspaper journalism. Friedman's Palestinian sympathies, dating to his undergraduate years, are by now a matter of public record, Far more damaging to his credibility is the journalistic bias to which he openly confesses in his book. Friedman there reveals that he was, in his own words, boiling with anger at Israel after the Lebanese massacre of Palestinians at Sabra and Shatila in 1982. Determined, again in his words, to nail Begin and Sharon and help get rid of them, a most curious role for a journalist, he wrote the article that won his first Pulitzer Prize. A week later, he proudly buried his word, the Israeli commanding officer on page one of the Times, after an interview in which Friedman writes, I was not professionally detached. Perhaps astonished by his own disclosure, Friedman concedes that an objective journalist is not supposed to have such emotions. But he insists that his anger at Israel made him a better reporter. I challenge that claim. In one of the most self-incriminating revelations in his book, Friedman described the ruthless PLO pressure upon journalists in Lebanon to heed the Arafat line, or else. Friedman lay awake one night, in his words, worrying that someone was going to burst in and blow my brains all over the wall. Hardly an unreasonable fear. The next day, Friedman was advised by an Arafat henchman to do a little better in the future. Still another debilitating handicap for Friedman, as for so many of his professional colleagues, is historical amnesia. Dating creation from his own awakening in 1967, Friedman virtually ignores the unceasing Arab terror against Jews that long antedated the Six-Day War. Palestinian nationalism, he imagines, resulted from Israeli occupation a statement certain to cause the Grand Mufti, Yasser Arafat's inspiration and relative, to turn over in his grave. The Palestinians, he claims, are only trying to signal to Israelis their readiness to live peaceably next door to Israel if Israelis would only vacate the territories and allow a Palestinian state to emerge there. To be sure, the Palestinians never said so. Friedman concedes that whenever he asked them why they threw stones, they did not reply by quoting Martin Luther King Jr. He recounts his dialogue with a Palestinian prisoner who asked the question about stone throwing, candidly replied, because I didn't have a grenade. What does the intifada mean, Friedman persisted? 
he was told, we want our land back. Which land? The land the Jews took in 1948. The problem of bias, needless to say, goes far beyond one journalist. Friedman has left Israel, but Time's coverage remains as problematic as ever. Enter Anthony Lewis. In 1976, Lewis wrote one article on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. In 1977, Begin's first year in office, he wrote seven. In 1978, warming to his political task, 25. In 1982, after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, 36. This outpouring was distinguished by moral hectoring of Israel for its departures from Mr. Lewis's standards of justice and morality. The bias inherent in his preoccupation has strengthened with time. During 1988, the first year of the Intifada, he wrote 46 articles on international subjects, none about Syria or Lebanon or Saudi Arabia or Jordan or Iraq or Iran, one each about all of Western Europe and Asia two on all of Central and Latin America, three on the Soviet Union, and 28 about Israelis and Palestinians. Similarly, whenever Israel holds an election, Times editors and columnists decry its system of proportional representation, which, whatever its flaws, far more democratically represents a far wider range of political opinion than American political norms can tolerate. And just this week, Friedman's successor, Joel Brinkley, very tentatively presented documentary evidence provided by Israel of continuing PLO sponsorship of terror, despite recent assurances to the contrary. Brinkley revealed that he actually spent one month investigating its authenticity largely by questioning PLO activists. When has that standard of care been applied to news critical of Israel provided by Palestinians? So, with or without Thomas Friedman, the New York Times continues to reiterate the currently fashionable demonology about the Middle East, invariably at the expense of Israel. Thank you. Now, there's a general remark to be made, I think, about all television. I don't watch television news anymore. Uh, it's a matter of principle to me. Because, <laughs> because television news is not and should not be called information. It is entertainment. If you want to be entertained about this, that, or the other thing, watch it. If you want information, you'd better go somewhere else. This doesn't change the fact, however, that according to most of the things I've seen, 50% of the people in this country get all of their information about the world from that medium. In the first year of the Intifada, the three major networks carried more than 800 stories on the Middle East, more than 1,200 minutes of coverage in all. The only other issue that received even closely comparable coverage was the U.S. presidential elections. Cameras Reuven Corrette analyzed that coverage. Here are some highlights of his analysis as well as additional commentary from other conference participants. I reviewed every video clip from the evening news broadcasts of ABC, NBC, and CBS that deal with the first year of the Intifada. In the first months of reporting, there is not even the most basic chronology of Middle East history. This is what changed the shape of Israel, the 1967 Six-Day War. Israel, in less than a week, expanded its territory by about a third no mention of Arab provocations, exhortations, and military preparations to drive the Jews into the sea. But in fact, Israel expanded much more than Mr. Brokaw gave them credit for. Israel's conquest of the Sinai actually tripled its size. But to mention that might remind viewers of an inconvenient fact that in expansionist Israel gave back 90% of the territory it conquered in exchange for the promise of peace with Egypt. Only in passing does Mr. Brokaw mention another important feature of Israeli geography. 
This was Israel before the war, just six miles across in some areas. In the entire 20 hours of news I reviewed, this was the only mention of Israel's dimensions. And we never see a map of Israel surrounded by its 22 Arab neighbors. Of course, we might not be able to see it because the Arab nations encompass 670 times the size of Israel. Now, largely ignoring the history and the geography, the networks focus intensely on the questions and issues surrounding riot control. Consider this event from the first week of the Intifada. Palestinian riders repeatedly took over a Gaza hospital and used it to launch attacks on Israeli patrols. The Palestinians of the Gaza Strip were today still defiant and still dangerous. The Shifa Hospital in Gaza City is less a hospital these days and more a fortified cover for firebomb attacks. Contrast that with a CBS report, which puts the Israeli reaction first and expresses doubts about the Palestinian provocation. Israeli soldiers stormed into an Arab hospital in Gaza today, chasing and beating Palestinian use. This was after the Palestinians allegedly threw rocks and firebombs. NBC doesn't mention what happened or why it happened. After seven straight days of rioting in the Israeli-occupied Gaza Strip, Israel's army spokesman said the situation's getting back to normal. You couldn't tell if you were there. Four Palestinians were shot dead today, about 20 more wounded. NBC doesn't mention firebomb throwers taking cover in the hospital, even though the, some of the rioters in its pictures are covered in doctor's smocks and patients' pajamas. It shows a fire burning in the road, but it doesn't show, as ABC did, the jeep at which the firebomb was thrown. It runs unexplained pictures of violence and gives a death toll. It sarcastically attacks Israeli credibility and Israeli competence. The report ends by showing a crowd of Arabs retreating in fear before Israeli soldiers, not showing the pro preceding provocations. In the most notorious and disturbing case, CBS filmed two Palestinians being battered by Israeli soldiers. Much is done in the Middle East in what passes for the heat of passion. This seemed cold, deliberate, methodical. It went on for 40 minutes. Israel's chief of staff said yesterday, Force should never be used once someone has been captured or as a means of punishment. Hospitals in the West Bank and Gaza are full of young Arabs with broken arms. This is how it's done. Multiple fractures with a rock. The boys did not scream. They did not beg. Here's the report from the following day. High-ranking officers know their soldiers are not always under control, but were stunned by what they saw on a CBS News videotape this morning. It showed four soldiers beating two captured Arabs for 40 minutes. Major General Amra Mitzna, commander of the West Bank, said he was shocked and taking immediate action against the soldiers. Three of them are already under arrest. The fourth will be in a couple of hours. I'm going to dismiss the um, deputy of the battalion commander from uh, his duty. He also freed the two rock-throwing Palestinians, saying he no longer cared what they had done. They were battered and bruised tonight and on their way home. Bob Simon, CBS News, Nablus. The Israeli general clearly recognizes the seriousness of the matter. The soldiers are to be punished and punished strictly. The Palestinians may be bruised, but they walk away. Notice there is no mention of broken bones in this report. Still. The repetition of this ugly incident went on for four months, sometimes injuries that the as doctors here in say slow motion. Israeli, so Israeli soldiers beating two The Arab fact that this video and a few others like it had to be repeated over and over again suggests another conclusion not mentioned by the networks. The fact that is that unnecessary extreme violence, brutal force was, as the Israeli authorities repeatedly insisted, were exceptions, exceptions that were consistently and firmly punished. I am appalled as a Jew, as a human rights activist, as a supporter of Israel, by some of the excesses that I see on those television cameras. I can be appalled at that and still be appalled at the media's lack of balance in reporting those excesses.
Do you know when you see that program that the only system where Arabs can go to anywhere in the Arab world to protest and to get systematic review and punishment for unnecessary force is to go to the Israeli authorities. Do we see that 600 soldiers have already been summoned for discipline? 86 of them have been court-martialed. Where else can you find comparable numbers? It's not perfect. And yet the reality from a human rights perspective, and I'm here as a human rights activist, by any fair standard of human rights, Israel belongs near the very top of any list of countries most sensitive to human rights. Indeed, I say, and I challenge, I challenge any human rights activist to, to, to contradict me on this, that no country in the history of the world faced with comparable threats externally and internally has ever given as much human rights to those who oppose it as Israel has even during the Intifada. I can say as someone who's been involved in human rights situations elsewhere in the world, in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, and alike, that sometimes I wish I would have had the same access to the democratic and human rights uh, machinery in each of these countries as I've had in Israel with respect to attempting to redress uh, human rights violations in Israel. In a word, as Voltaire put it, if you take something out of context, you can hang anybody. Placing detailed Palestinian claims first and terse Israeli denials after inherently will prejudice the viewer. All three networks reported that this <coughs> young boy, 15-year-old Rami El Alouk, was beaten to death by Israelis. Why did they believe it? Because the Palestinian doctor who arranged the press conference and took them on the press tours told them so. A doctor's helplessness and a father's despair as this 15-year-old boy dies of head injuries received in a riot. In the Middle East today, United Nations officials say that the Israelis have beaten another Palestinian to death in the occupied territories. He was 15 years old, and his burial in the Gaza Strip inevitably turned into another demonstration, and then once again, confrontation. But hospital records show that a year before, Rami had a brain hemorrhage from which he never fully recovered. He re-entered the Mokassid Hospital for treatment of this condition. He died of natural causes. The truth later came out, but not one network ran the corrected version of it. In the following NBC report on the Dimona bus attack, no mention is made of the fact that the terrorists are Palestinians or the fact that Arafat claimed responsibility. It was the sort of scene Israelis have witnessed before and can never accept. The suffering of innocent civilians, the victims of a terrorist attack. Early this morning, deep inside Israeli territory in the Negev Desert, Three gunmen hijacked a bus carrying workers from Israel's main nuclear facility. They threatened to kill the hostages one by one unless authorities released Palestinians held in Israeli jails. When they carried out their threat on the first hostage, an elite Israeli anti-terrorist unit stormed the bus. The terrorists and two passengers were killed in the crossfire. But listen to the following ABC introduction to the events of the day, an introduction which is actually longer than the on-the-scene report which follows. In the Middle East today, Israeli soldiers shot and wounded at least 12 Palestinians in the occupied territories, and there was a report today that for the first time since this uprising began, Palestinians in the territories had thrown a hand grenade at Israeli soldiers. Palestinians under occupation have been encouraged by their leadership not to use weapons, even if they have them. On the other hand, some Palestinians do come across the border prepared to do battle. In southern Israel today, three armed Palestinians hijacked an Israeli bus. ABC's Dean Reynolds has the details. Mr. Jennings reports the body count when Israeli mistreatment is alleged, but he fails to mention in that introduction even the basic fact that some, some people died. Consider this next clip, which is the first NBC report from the scene of an attack on Jewish hikers in the village of Beta. Palestinians called the ambulances to treat their wounded. Instead, the Arab medics found the Israeli victims. Along the road, by the small Arab village, they found a dead Jewish girl, a 14-year-old whose head was smashed in by a rock. And a Jewish man, his head also smashed in, but breathing. Teenage settlers on a holiday hike were surrounded by Arabs and stoned. 
two armed Israeli guards killed two Arabs, wounded two more, then ran out of ammunition. The Arabs swarmed over the Israelis, beat them with rocks and fled. The following day, Mr. Jennings reports on a new development. Now a report from the Israeli army that very forcefully suggests the girl was not killed by Palestinians. The army says the bullet came from the gun of one of the Israeli bodyguards and that no weapons were apparently fired by the Palestinians in the village. Army investigators also concluded that the villagers intended no harm to the Israeli teenagers. A complete report by the army, released several weeks later, concluded that the hikers had been attacked by hundreds of Arabs, had been driven to the center of the village, had been hit with a hail of rocks. One of the attacker's rocks hit the guard in the head, knocked him unconscious, and caused a reflexive discharge of his rifle that killed the girl. The villagers continued to beat her and the others even after they had fallen. Less than 10 villagers tried to help the hikers, over 200 attacked them. Of all the networks, ABC alone referred to, to the report. Some of the villages were deported. More than a dozen homes in Beta destroyed. The army said today that the villagers were responsible for the violence that day, even though the two Palestinians and the Israeli girl were killed by Israelis. But a favorite network analogy links Israel with South Africa. Here NBC combines an unattributed quotation with some creative splicing. As the violence continues in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, U.S. officials have grown increasingly resigned to their lack of influence over Israel. They compare the situation to that in South Africa, saying outsiders can have little impact on how governments handle what they consider an internal threat. ABC tries a slightly more sophisticated approach. As John McCarthy notes, the Israelis, who are certainly accustomed to criticism, are particularly sensitive about being compared to South Africa. Are there comparisons between the two? First, security. How does each deal with unrest? And are there comparisons between the way most Palestinians and South African blacks live? If you are a Palestinian or South African black, how much freedom do you have to move about? In Israel or South Africa, if you run up against the authorities, what rights would you have? Both Israel and South Africa have parliamentary governments. But who has a vote? And is the press free to cover and report on unrest and confrontation? In point of fact, unlike South Africa, Israel grants all of its citizens, Jew, Arab, and Christian alike, the same full democratic rights, rights to vote, rights to assembly, rights to open passage within the country, a free press, and more. There is, as Alan Keyes explains, a vast difference between a nation that denies those rights to its own citizens and one which grants them to its citizens, but is also the authority over territories whose status remains undetermined. South Africa is a situation in which, within a country, the majority of citizens in that country have been denied full political participation, economic participation, and social equality. It is, I think, quintessentially a domestic conflict that must be resolved on the basis of a constitutional transformation of South Africa, so as to grant and give and recognize in the South African majority, the black majority, the rights that are inherent in their humanity. That's very simple. But it's a civil, civil conflict that points to the need for constitutional change. Israel has involved in an international conflict, and the situation on the West Bank is being used and manipulated as a weapon in that conflict. See, and that's a very different situation altogether. Uh, at, at, at best, one can talk about it as a human rights problem under certain circumstances where violations occur, but you cannot talk about it, as some people have tried to in their parallels and so forth, as a problem of civil rights, because no civil society in the formal sense, exists. Israel and the West Bank and Jordan, they're separate countries. They're separate international entities. Israel has, as a result of the 67 war, responsibilities as an authority in the West Bank territory, but the actual status of those territories is subject to negotiation, international negotiation, if I may say so. Not a negotiation, civil negotiation over constitutional forms. So fundamentally and in principle, the two situations are different and they should not be talked about as if they are the same. The ANC is not advocating for the destruction of the uh, white regime, for a change to give them the right to participate in the government, but not to destroy. The PLO covenant specifically states the destruction of Israel. Israel should not be immune from criticism, but the criticism should be fair, it should be accurate, and it should be informed.
Regrettably, the networks have elevated Palestinian street theater into a major motion picture at the expense of the larger geographical, historical, and political context. And still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, a shower of stones, shots, and another death in Israeli-occupied Palestine. The theatrical productions screened on the evening news have so far served more to obscure the issues than to illuminate them. Instead of romancing the stones, it's time the networks covered the whole story. Thank you. Public television's McNeil Lehrer Report generally provides reasonably fair coverage of controversial issues. However, the record of the public broadcasting system in its documentary programming is something else altogether. Consider these examples of PBS's offerings on the Middle East. Frontlines the Arab and the Israeli pairs a far-left Israeli politician and a moderate Palestinian, falsely implying that they represent the mainstream view on their respective sides, and worse, suggesting strongly that only their approach can work for peace. Israel, the price of victory, portrays Israel as a country without a soul, its soul having been lost in the 1967 war. In the film's view, Israel has become lazy, greedy, and paralyzed by the right wing. Among the solutions recommended is cutting American aid so that Israelis can again become the brave pioneers they once were. Daughters of Abraham is another misleading and simplistic piece. The two women on which the film is focused are portrayed as fully representative of the two sides in the conflict. Never mind that the Palestinian woman is a Quaker, one of the few Quakers anywhere in the Middle East, and that the Israeli is Geula Cohen, whose party's far-right politics precluded its joining the National Unity Government. Stephen York's A Letter from Palestine is a vicious and groundless attack on Israeli medical care in the West Bank and Gaza. York completely ignores even the report of the United Nations, no friend of Israel's, which lauds Israeli medical advances in the administered territories and the resulting decrease in infant mortality and increase in life expectancy. Instead, York falsely portrays Israel as a nation that routinely denies medical care to Palestinians as a matter of policy. In spite of documented evidence, York ignores environmental and ecological improvements that have eliminated polio and malaria in the territories and the vast expansion of hospital and health care facilities for Palestinians. Of course, York did admit to one limitation in his objectivity. He was, in his own words, a guest among Palestinians who take their hospitality seriously. Israel, the covert connection, is another example of Frontline's tendency to undermine Israel's legitimacy by flagrant distortion of fact. This film, made by longtime foe and critic of Israel, Andrew Cokeburn, portrays Israel as both the doer of America's dirty work and at the same time a traitor to American interests. Israel, in Cokeburn's view, is greedy, power-hungry, manipulative, and without any redeeming value. Days of Rage is one of the most viciously anti-Israel films ever to air on American television. One PBS official compared it to the work of the famed Nazi propagandist Lenny Riefenstahl. And even the film's writer and producer, Joe Franklin Trout, admitted that it was intended to be a propaganda piece. The inflammatory nature of the film, coupled with the fact that its funding was linked to an Arab pressure group, should have been enough to keep it off PBS. Alan Keyes participated in a special panel discussion which surrounded the airing of the program on PBS. I, I don't think it was an accident that something like Days of Rage should be trotted out by PBS and even lauded by some of my fellow panelists as legitimate journalism. It is journalism that fits the paradigm. It is journalism that was aimed at reinforcing the sense of victimization. It is journalism that had, in accordance with this paradigm, focused on the immediate so-called brutalization and ignored the whole history, ignored all events and characters and characteristics that had led up to this situation. But most importantly of all, most importantly of all, it was journalism that act as, as if the world consists entirely of Israeli soldiers and Palestinian youths. Finally, David Shipler's Arab and Jew Wounded Spirits in a Promised Land reduces the entire Arab-Israeli conflict to a struggle, in his words, between Palestinian Arabs and Israelis over the same small piece of land. Shipler presents the conflict as one between two peoples equally wronged, ignoring that Israel is surrounded by 22 Arab nations that remain in a state of war against her, or recent polls of Palestinians by Palestinians, which show that fully 80% do not accept even the concept of a two-state solution. The insidious nature of Schiffler's analysis is amplified in the PBS viewing guide distributed by the network to more than 40,000 schools. Cameras Charles Jacobs analyzed the guide. 
The guide is propaganda. On every position about the Arab-Jewish conflict, it teaches the Arab position. It teaches students the falsehood that before Zionism, Arabs and Jews lived in relative harmony. In this guide, there is no doubt that the PLO will be satisfied with a two-state solution. This guide denies that Islamic fundamentalism has any role to play in Arab thinking about Jews or a Jewish state. Unfortunately, many teachers won't know that the lessons in this guide are the centerpieces of the Arab campaign against the Jewish state. Take the issue of terrorism. The book teaches that Jewish and Arab actions are alike. To prove the point, the massacre of <clears throat> Jews by Arabs at Gush Etzion is juxtaposed to the killing of Arabs by Jews at Deir Yassin. And the lesson is symmetry. Two sides, two rights, two terrorisms, voila, moral equivalence. There are many conflicting arguments about what happened at Deir Yassin, but most important, the killing of civilians there in that village was unique in the Israeli struggle with the Arabs. It was roundly denounced and condemned by Jewish leadership and the Jewish people. In contrast, the slaughter of Jews by Arabs in Gush Etzion was typical. Arabs have a long record of targeting Jewish civilians which continues today. And it is typical for Arab terrorists to publicly celebrate the results of their atrocities with the support of the Arab publics and the leaders of the Arab states. Next in the guide, the idea that Arabs and Jews lived in harmony until Zionism is a mainstay of Arab propaganda. Let me quote you Yasser Arafat. We have been living with each other Christians, Jews, and Muslims in peace and fraternity for centuries. This is a lie wrapped in a fairy tale. You expect that from Yasser Arafat. But here is PBS, your PBS. Quote, in Palestine, long before Israel was created in 1948, the Jewish minority lived with the Arab majority in a mixture of accommodation and antipathy. Jewish and Arab children played together in the dusty streets of Jerusalem, Tiberias, and Hebron. Though, he says, in some places and at certain times there were confrontations. The story of Jews under Islam is summed up briefly by Bernard Lewis. Jews lived in the Arab countries as diminished people, in an exposed position, periodically massacred, so that they would be acutely conscious of their position. Why do Palestinians have negative stereotypes toward Jews? Schipler says, it is due to Jewish domination of the Arab masses and because the Arabs do the menial work of Israeli society. And so the Arabs see, according to Schipler, the Arabs see the Jews as owners, exploiters, and demeaning oppressors. But the fact is, that the Palestinian images of the Jews are no different than the anti-Semitic images seen in the daily papers of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Kuwait, and even Egypt. These people have never worked for Jews, and they have never been ruled by Jews. Instead, what fills Arab minds are the age-old images of Jewish inferiority, worthlessness, and evil. Let me quote you from the semi-official daily in Egypt, El Aram, a year ago. I lower my pen in respect to the author who presents proof to the malice of the Jews who wish to kill all male newborns and pregnant women in order to uproot the Palestinians. And that is from Israel's only Arab peace partner. But all this the guidebook ignores. You know, in the glossary, the word pogrom doesn't exist. The word anti-Semitism doesn't exist. The word Hamas doesn't exist. On the other hand, what about the feelings of Jews toward Arabs? According to Schipler, it's mere, pure, simple racism. Listen, in your schools, listen. In Jewish eyes, the Arab is dirty, lazy, 
thieving, incompetent, and uppity. And if anybody missed that point, question 12 in the guide hammers it home. It says, what are some of the patterns of prejudice and discrimination between Jews and Arabs that exist between groups in other countries, including blacks and whites in the United States? How could a black child sitting in an American classroom fail to notice that these words of hatred so often aimed at him, dirty, lazy, thieving, uppity, are the very ones, according to Schipler, used by Jews against Arabs. PBS seems to be teaching black children that in the very same way the Klan hates you, Jews hate Arabs. How could black students not be enraged at such hateful people and their American cousins? Why does the guide speak in the voice of Arab propagandists? Let me introduce you to the people who brought you this program, the Board of Advisors. On this Board of Advisors, to be balanced, there's two Jews, two Arabs, and a few others. Munir Farah said on the Arab Hour in Boston that his job is to bring the Arab perspective into the American classroom. Skipping to Rabbi Marshall Meyer, who's our first Jew, Rabbi Meyer signed a statement that, quote, affirms the right of Palestinian people to self-determination, including the right to establish an independent state on the West Bank and Gaza. The next Arab person is Hisham Sharabi, who was not accurately identified in the guide. Many of you will remember from reports in the New Republic and the New York Times that Mr. Sharabi is head of the Arab American Cultural Association Foundation, which paid $30,000 to Joe Franklin Trout to help her fund Days of Rage. This embarrassed PBS, as you recall, but not enough, it seems. Our next Jewish person is Gail Pressburg. She just happens to be the executive director of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. And last year, she won an award for a contribution of exceptional merit in the field of Arab American affairs, furthering the cause of Arab American understanding. The runner up to that award was Edward Said. <laughs> Ronald Young is the Middle East representative of the American Friends Service Committee. The Quakers, whose stand on Israel is well known to us. The three other people, Robert Gardner, Schipler himself, we know about, and there's a school teacher who we couldn't contact. We have two Arab propagandists, two pro-Palestinian Jews, an anti-Israeli Quaker, not one person to represent the mainstream moderate position of the Israelis. But let's sum up, class. PBS teaches that what is important about the terrorist acts is that they can happen on both sides, not that they usually don't. PBS teaches that the, that the Jewish deliverance from Arab rule made the naturally tolerant Arabs understandably angry. If anti-Semitism is a light sleeper, then PBS has just placed 40,000 alarm clocks in American schoolrooms. While the conference stressed media sins of commission, another significant aspect of the problem is the media's sin of omission. Harvard law professor and internationally renowned lawyer Alan Dershowitz suggested some ways in which the media might redress the imbalance. First, let's see a two-hour report on Palestinian justice, vigilantism, and censorship, the killing of Palestinians by Palestinians, the intra fata. That would make a wonderful television show. <laughs> let's see a show on has the PLO given up terrorism since it began speaking to the United States? The new evidence printed in the New York Times of continuing terrorism against civilians. Let's see a show on anti-Jewish aspects of the Palestinian movement from the Grand Mufti's alliance with Hitler to Hamas to the terrorizing of Jewish religious institutions <laughs> to the recent statement of the current Grand Mufti, quote, Kill the Jews until the stone shall cry, O Muslim, this Jew is hiding beneath me. Come and kill him, stated just three months ago. Let's see a show on the PLO support of Chinese repression. 
the congratulatory telegram sent by Arafat to the Chinese for, quote, restoring normal order after the recent uh, incident. Imagine the response if Israel had restored order in a similar fashion. Let's see a story about what a PLO state would look like, the influence of Islamic fundamentalism, of PFLP communism, and of Hamas anti-Semitism. Let's see a show on Arab voices of dissent against PLO terrorism, a very short show indeed. <laughs> Let's see a show on the PLO technique of deliberately increasing their own civilian casualties by placing women and children in terrorist camps and sending them out to throw rocks. Let's see a show on the true story of the refugees. Why were they not settled between 48 and 67? A comparison to Israel's refugee policy. Another very short show, a history of Arab elections, democracy, free speech, and the press. Let's see a show on the source of South African oil that fuels apartheid, Saudi Arabia, and other Arab suppliers. Let's see a show on a history of Arab terrorism and massacres from Hebron to Hadassah Hospital to the modern PLO. Let's see a show on the treatment of Jews in Arab countries, Syria, Iran, Saudi Arabia, it's a short show on Saudi Arabia because they won't even let us in. Let's see a show on other stateless refugees, on the Kurds, on the Baha'is, on the Tatars, on the Armenians. A show that asks the question, why is their case not much stronger than the case for a 23rd Arab state? And finally, let's see a two-hour show on Andrea Levin's analysis of the Boston Globe. It would make marvelous marvelous television. The extent of distorted media coverage of Israel inevitably raises the very serious question, why this distortion? For two differing perspectives on that question, we turn to McGill University professor Ruth Weiss and University of Massachusetts historian, professor, and author David Wyman. First, Professor Weiss. This inversion works, I think, in two phases and those two phases are worth keeping in mind. The first phase is the phase of establishing a symmetry where there is none. This asymmetry is strained in order to create a balance, and you see how the newspapers do this. Jews frightened of Arabs, Arabs frightened of Jews. Extremism on both sides. What a boon Mayor Kahane was to the liberal imagination that engages in this kind of symmetry. Mayor Kahana made it possible for even the New Republic, which is by no means, of course, the worst of such publications, to put him as the monster on the cover, implying, of course, that there is extremism on both sides, implying that there is some kind of an equation between a man who gets 1% of the vote, or 2% of the vote, and the policy of 20 governments and of an entire Muslim people. In the second step, the Jews are made the villains responsible for everything. The map is shrunk, as we have seen it, from the map of the, of the whole Middle East to the map of Israel, in which uh, the Palestinian Arabs loom so small. And the Arab war against the Jews is turned into an Israeli war against the Palestinians. Now, the plight of the Palestinian Arabs is very real, as we all know. But the given reasons for that plight is bogus. Um, I don't have to tell you again that partition was, of course, repudiated by the Arabs, not by Israel. The Arabs were kept homeless by the Arabs, not by Israel. The War of 67, which displaced more refugees, was initiated by the Arabs and not by Israel. But nevertheless, in keeping with the big lie of propaganda, the Palestinians were sent around the world and above all to our campuses and terrorist activity was sponsored very widely as evidence of Israeli aggression. And what has happened increasingly is that the Palestinian Arabs represent themselves to the world as Jews. Um, they are longing from the diaspora for their promised homeland, their charter is called a covenant, as we saw this morning. Their ship is named the Exodus. 
and of course, most infamously of all, they claimed to be subject to the Holocaust. When publicity was desperately needed to draw attention to the plight of Europe's Jews, the American media were nearly silent. When constant and exaggerated publicity may harm millions of Israeli Jews, the American media are in full cry. As far as I can see, neither response can be sufficiently explained by rational factors. And I'm going to introduce a term that I have not heard here today in regard to an attempt at explaining what's happening with the media and Israel right now. I have finally been forced, and very reluctantly forced, to the conclusion that a significant factor in the media's response then and now is anti-Semitism. The people I'm talking about in the media then and the media today, in most cases, it is not an instance of the blatant anti-Semitism of a Father Coughlin then or a Louis Farrakhan today, nor is it a case of the overt anti-Semitism of those people who desecrate synagogues and those people who make bigoted calls to talk shows. These people in the media do not see themselves as anti-Semitic. They would not personally mistreat a Jew. Almost certainly, if a Jew came to them for help, they would be responsive. But beneath the surface, perhaps unconscious, probably uncrystallized, are definite negative feelings about Jews. Where did these feelings come from? They are not unique to the people I'm speaking about. These feelings, the negativism toward Jews, these feelings are deeply ingrained in Western society. They are the legacy. They are the legacy of 2,000 years of anti-Semitism in Western culture. Almost all non-Jews are infected to some degree. I was infected as a child. At times, even now, I have to fight that. The parallel for you if you're Jewish and for, for all whites in American society is the infection of anti-black racism, which is built into our culture. And if you honestly examine yourself, if you're white in America, almost all of us have to admit to some of that having been injected, infected into us. And so this has been the case across 2,000 years in Western society in regard to non-Jews' perception of Jews. One main theme suggested by almost all press coverage is that the key to peace in the Middle East lies in the creation of an independent Palestinian state on the West Bank. While camera takes no position on any preferred solution to the problem, commentary editor Norman Podhoritz offered the conference his reasoning as to why such a solution cannot work, and Alan Keyes argued strongly that such a settlement would fail to meet the human and civil rights of a majority of Palestinians. The first thing that would happen almost certainly, is the eruption of a civil war among the many different factions who would be vying for control of the new state. As I've already indicated, and as we all know, the PLO itself is made up of rival factions who have often in the past been at one another's throats, and now with so much more at stake, would be even more violent in pursuing their objectives. There would be a lot of killing, internecine killing. What you would see, in short, was what we might call the Lebanonization of the new Palestinian state. And of course, the PLO itself played no small role in turning Lebanon from a peaceful democratic society into that Hobbesian hell. At some point, we would see another resemblance to Lebanon. We would see Syrian intervention. Because just as Syria regards Lebanon as its own and used the civil war in Lebanon as an excuse for moving in, so it regards Palestine in the old sense, the whole of mandatory Palestine, which includes not only Israel and the territories, but also uh, Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, it regards all of this land as southern Syria, 
and it would be strongly tempted to move in as a, quotes, peacekeeper after a certain length of time had elapsed in the civil war in the New Palestine. It would almost certainly trigger a war between Israel and Syria with the Palestinians at this point joining in with the Syrians. And by a monstrous irony, if Israel were to win, having suffered all those casualties and so many Palestinians having also been slaughtered, if Israel were to win, it would find itself back occupying the same territory, withdrawal from which had triggered all the trouble in the first place. Every time I look at the situation in the Middle East, the same thing strikes me. We spend all this time talking about Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who are denied self-determination and self-government. We can't spend much time talking about Palestinians and Arabs in Israel because they're not denied participation in self-government. They do participate in democracy in Israel. But everyone seems to then go jauntily along assuming that it is possible to speak of justice for the Palestinians, as they now identify themselves, justice for them without talking about Jordan at all. Jordan is today a state, the majority of whose residents are Palestinians. I understand a few months ago, King of Jordan tried to change the census to hide this fact, but we all know that it's true. We also know, with apologies to those who believe that the West Bank is actually part of Israel, I think this is still subject to negotiation and ought to be, uh, but if you include the West Bank in Jordan, then the population, the Palestinian population of Jordan skyrockets to 85% Palestinian, in, as I understand it. Now tell me, we are seeing demands for the satisfaction of democratic aspirations in some of the most unlikely places in the world. Not only in the places we all hear about, South Africa, South America, but in Hungary and East Germany and Poland and Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union itself. There seems to be only one part of the world where men dare not speak the name of liberty. And that, for some reason, is the Arab world. And so I am considered a great bomb thrower when I suggest that one of the first and critical steps toward peace in the Middle East is a truly representative government in the state of Jordan, not the king's option, not the tyrant's option, not the monarchy's option, but the option of the people. So you tell me why it is that the so-called champions of Palestinian freedom will not champion the cause of Palestinians in Jordan. You tell me why it is that the champions of Palestinian self-determination have no words to describe the tyranny and repression in Jordan. You tell me why it is that I am looked upon as some ungodly heretic because I dare to speak the name of freedom in connection with the Arab world. I imagine what the situation would be like if a democratically elected government of Jordan, and I always see Jordan in this case including the Palestinian population of the West Bank, with apologies to all who disagree. What if, if the democratically elected government of Jordan, which as I understand it, given the way the demographics work, would have, if it were truly representative, a Palestinian prime minister, a Palestinian foreign minister, a Palestinian ministry elsewhere, and so forth and so on. And don't get me wrong, I happen to believe that if you really think it through, this has no dangers for the king. As a matter of fact, it's the only way his monarchy will survive in the long run. And if he did it, you would have such a government. A balanced constitutional regime, stable, protected both by Israel and, and America's interest from the depredations of Syria and others who would like to see him destroyed and overthrown, and the entire world, in fact, once they understood what an important contribution this would make to peace. Because then, the representatives of two states not one state and one irresponsible movement. Not one state and one group of terrorists and thugs. Not one state and one group that answers to no one except force and violence. But one state and another state, whose representatives are democratically chosen by their people, would sit down at a negotiating table 
to work out the differences between them, to establish secure and recognized borders, to come to an understanding that would extend at first to their territorial differences, and at last, I believe, to their ultimate cooperation. Now that is a little hope that I see. I don't see it in anything that's being discussed now, but it accomplishes two purposes. Besides opening the door to a new possibility, it also reminds us of some old truths. And those old truths are clear. Today, we are led to believe that Israel is the obstacle. Israel is the responsible one. Israel has the decision to make about the future. It's never been the case that war ended when one side decided that it should. Peace will come in the future, as has always been understood in the past, when both sides accept their responsibilities. And whether the paradigm is the paradigm of peace and war, or the paradigm of freedom and self-government, there are responsibilities on both sides. And those responsibilities must be clearly defined and clearly met if peace is to be achieved. And if we do not articulate the Arab responsibility under the paradigm of human rights that today dominates, we will not be doing a service to peace or a service to justice. We must renew our dedication to some essentials. The essential of truth is clear. The essential of peace is still with us in spite of all. And the essential of justice must be addressed, not as a weapon against Israel, but on its own terms for all Palestinians. Thank you very much. Information is power, the power to effect change. It is CAMERA's goal to draw to the attention of the public and the media the superficial, out of context, and even flagrantly inaccurate reporting of events in the Middle East that has characterized so much of the media's coverage. We know that regular distortions of the truth inevitably will subvert public opinion, a grave danger in a nation where public opinion ultimately shapes public policy. The threat to the future of American-Israel relations, and thus to Israel's survival, is very real and very direct. And so we close with a few words from Maxine Wolf, Associate Director of Boston Camera, and Professor Alan Dershowitz. We hope you will work with and support CAMERA's efforts in research and response, which we feel is the most effective way to have your voice heard. But as individuals, you also have obligations. Learn to recognize and appreciate contextually sound reporting. But if you don't trust what you see or hear in the media, challenge it. We dare not be silent when the globe equates the use of conventional tear gas for riot control in Israeli prisons with the Nazis' genocidal use of Zyklon B2 in the gas chambers or when the Atlanta Constitution prints a cartoon of Anne Frank being arrested in her attic by soldiers with stars of David on their uniforms, or when a local talk show host compares the Intifada to Hiroshima, or when a TV anchorman slanders us all by saying that Friends of Israel are gloating, gloating over the carnage in Lebanon, or when PBS airs a program like Daughters of Abraham in which they attempt to palm off as a, a Quaker as a typical West Bank Palestinian, one of a handful of Quakers in the entire Arab world, or when this month NBC TV News reported glowingly that in the West Bank and Gaza district, Palestinian children are taught to express their opposition to Israelis through art and song. Omitting the firebombs that these youngsters are encouraged to throw, or the concrete blocks they drop in he on heads, or the filthy anti-Semitic books that Israelis regularly find in Palestinian schools. NBC failed to inform its viewers that the current hit in Gaza is the bus song, which celebrates the terrorist who conducted the July attack on an Israeli bus that killed 16 civilians. NBC TV's selected half-truths added up to one genuine falsehood. The media must be held responsible for its actions the First Amendment, after all, as Jefferson reminded us, is best served by an audience capable of reading and viewing critically, rather than accepting passively. And for too long, we have been at the mercy of the media. We have not had the information 
necessary to allow us to say more than, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't read right. That doesn't look right. Now we know, and thanks to camera, we know the truth and we are able to read with a more critical eye. The media wants every important institution in this country to be scrutinized, except the media. This is not consistent. <laughs> this is not consistent with freedom of speech, and this conference marks the end of those days. No more immunity from criticism for the media in America. So I urge you, complain. Complain and complain. And until the media gets it right, keep complaining. And until the media understands that they do not have a monopoly on the truth, we will make sure that the people see the whole truth. They may not see it all on the pages of one newspaper, but when they read that newspaper and they see the critique of the newspaper, then and only then will they see the truth. And we have nothing to fear from the truth. Thank you.